In this episode of Investors and Operators, I sit down with Luke Redman, CEO of Hospital Internists of Texas. And today we're going to be covering the path over the past five years that the business has experienced, including some of the challenges and the successes. We want this episode to be very practical for the other uh, healthcare services CEOs out there and managers out there, as well as the uh, investment banking and private equity community. So uh, Luke, if you wouldn't mind, before we dive deep, can you just kind of give a little bit of background on HIT and uh, your background? Yeah, well, HIT, you know, the group as it is been around since 1996. We went through a big corporate transition back in 2017, uh, to prepare ourselves to take outside investment at some point. And so that's when we became Hospital Interests of Texas. It was really uh, a group that had over the years become a little bit too mature to, uh, to warrant any outside investment. And so what we wanted to do was go through this transformation and kind of prepare ourselves uh, for an outside equity investment. Um, and so that process is what we've been on over the past five years. So I came to the group from the health insurance side of things. My focus is on contracting and provider operations. And so um, part of what I brought to the group was just the ability to kind of build the value around this new form of insurance contracting that uh, is driving higher multiples for investors. Okay, let's give maybe some facts and figures on five years ago versus today, just to kind of help paint the picture a little bit more. And then I'd like to dive into that first stage when you needed to get ready to take outside investment and then walking us from that. But let's start off kind of facts and figures kind of before and after. Yeah. So five years ago, the group is actually quite a bit bigger, uh, but a lot less diversified. And so, uh, you know, we really had a very small footprint of facilities. Um, we had a lot of providers, but we really weren't operating uh, at very much profit. And so um, there was there was a lot of strategic risk associated with that, uh, in that we really didn't have um, the diversification that we needed to kind of be stable and generate good profit. So we were always having to kind of deal with these 50 meter targets that were popping up. Um, and that was really operationally disruptive, financially disruptive. So part of our transformation was really shrinking the group um, down to what was going to be you know, core elements that were going to generate value um, and be profitable and stable. And the other part was really just diversifying to give ourselves a lot more kind of agency operationally and, uh, and not have to have so many eggs in one basket. So where, uh, so t- today, I think on your uh either webpage or profile saying that your group serves around 70 facilities. And yep. are, are you okay sharing with like, like how many people are in the firm, like doctors, NPs, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah. So right now we have about 35 physicians, about 25 nurse practitioners. We serve uh, facilities that are healthcare facilities, hospitals, nursing homes, assisted livings, uh, rehab facilities, and so kind of our value proposition to the people that refer business to us or the insurers that contract with us is being able to follow patients throughout what we call an acute care episode. So you, you come to the hospital, you might need some rehab after that. Um, and the other thing that we specialize in is really taking care of patients that are uh, very old and complicated and disabled. These are people that are really high utilizers of the healthcare system. And so they tend to be in and out of the hospital a lot. And being able to follow those patients across different settings of care allows our providers to uh, deliver a better outcome overall that's going to be more economical, uh, save money and higher quality. So let's go to that first chapter of the transformation. Like, where was the business at? Do you mean it was like double the size? or triple the size in terms of headcount. And we, can you kind of walk us through that first phase and how you identified what to focus on and what not to focus on? And sure. to, to what extent does this actually, does this relate to a lot of other similar practices out there in, 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 the, in the country? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I think it could relate to other physician practices or really just other businesses in general. Uh, you know, we were very heavy on physicians. So at the time we had around 90 physicians and about 10 nurse practitioners. You know, one of the aspects of medical practice nowadays, and you see this across all specialties, is that uh, the physicians are obviously a necessary element for, for good health outcomes. 
um, but they generally don't generate that much profit. A lot of the profit comes from what uh, are often called mid-level practitioners, nurse practitioners and physician assistants. Um, so that, that was one aspect was kind of getting the, the equilibrating the headcount so that we had more profit generating staff. That was one part. The other part was that we really served a limited number of hospitals and we were not in some of these other settings of care. And the problem with that was uh, kind of manifold. So the, the first issue is that it, we weren't diversified. The second issue is that we really were just contracted with these facilities to do um, a very limited uh, set of services. And so that was kind of not just not diversified from a footprint perspective, but from a services perspective. And so that kind of put us in a position where a lot of, you know, these hospitals really have leverage against us and we need to have more of our own kind of leverage. So by going out into some of these subacute facilities, basically what we were doing was going from having very short-term relationships with patients that were just in and out of the hospital to having more long-term longitudinal relationships and being able to have a little bit more control of the utilization of those patients. So, you know, doctors that work in hospitals, they don't want the patients to come back to the hospital, but there's actually very little they can do to kind of prevent that from happening. If you want to be able to kind of control utilization in healthcare, you have to be on the outside of the hospital as well, because by the time the patients come to the hospital, it's too late to really prevent any utilization at that point. Um, so can you talk about that first part with shifting the mixture towards more mid-level, higher profit practitioners? Um, how common do you think that is with others in a similar space? And kind of how did you first get to that? Because maybe other practices are like, yeah, we're doing the same thing. And can you kind of walk us through first, how did you get to that stage? And then what was it like kind of going through that uh, remix? Yeah, um, well, I th part of it was just kind of part and parcel with diversifying into the subacute facilities because uh, nurse practitioners, physician assistants are really taking the lead on the care day to day with the patients in those facilities. Uh, the other aspect was even within the acute facilities, um, it's really about kind of uh, volume leverage. So, you know, a physician can only see so many patients themselves, but they can supervise multiple mid-level practitioners. And so, but by having one doctor, this kind of very high cost asset, rather than seeing 15 or 20 patients a day, you could have a doctor to patient ratio, of maybe like 30 to 50 by having the doctor see their own patients and then supervise nurse practitioners that are seeing patients as well. So this is something you really see, you know, obviously our providers are internal medicine, so they're solving medical issues with the patients, but you see it with surgical providers as well, or other proceduralists, um, anesthetists, uh, emergency room, you know, even surgical providers, they, they might have uh, physician assistants or nurse practitioners that kind of do the follow-up with patients and the preoperative clearance. And that really allows the proceduralist to focus on doing the procedure and not necessarily having to do office visits or follow-up with patients. So th it's a trend that's kind of been happening um, all across healthcare and the ambulatory as well as inpatient settings. And that's really about um, kind of not having enough doctors to see the patients and, and meet the demand, but it's also about doing what's most economical. So, you know, if a physician can uh, generate maybe 5% profit margin, mid-level providers can generate between 20 and 30% profit margin. Um, and they're, you know, it's relatively uh, easier to come by those mid-level providers in terms of the uh, supply of them, the market that is physicians. And even though the turnover can be a little bit higher, uh, that's all kind of baked into the profit model. So the, the next question I want to get into is how you started to diversify uh, in terms of, it sounds like the hospital, the hospitals, as well as getting uh, broader services within the hospitals. Can you kind of walk us through that process and then taking a, the big picture of what do you think are the key questions that management teams need to ask this month, this week, this quarter with their teams? Well, I think in healthcare, you know, there's a lot of spend uh, and there's just a lot of opportunity as well. And so people tend to think, well, I'm just going to go in there and I'm just going to get this business. But there's very few services that are not currently being delivered by somebody else. So it's actually quite competitive. So a lot of what we had to do to diversify our services base was go out and really market ourselves to referral sources and make a case for why they should refer to us, why they should go through the trouble of doing that. Because nowadays, 
you know, any uh, physician group, they're going to be very busy, very overstretched. They're very, everything in healthcare is very status quo biased, whether it's providers or facilities. And so, you know, why should they change the status quo? Um, so a lot of what we did was we focused on doing this, uh, this new type of insurance contracting, value-based contracting. We went around to groups that were also involved in that, and we made a case to them that by referring to us, we were going to help drive more profit for them and their contracts. That's something you really have to focus on the why for those people. And then you have to execute. Um, a lot of people go around in healthcare and they kind of make these pitches and they say the right things, but that they don't execute. So you really got to focus on the execution. And so that, that kind of happens in phases. Um, and while you can never really stop doing the market development side of things, you definitely can never stop doing the execution thing because in healthcare, a lot of these relationships are quite ephemeral and they'll go away in a moment. Uh, it's, it just takes one slip up and you're not getting those referrals anymore. How did you look at the execution side and what was kind of your dashboard, for example? And was there a, a transformation of kind of how you measured the execution and kind of when you started versus six months or 12 months later? For me, the most important thing is really keeping in good contact with those people, setting up regular meetings. I think you really can't expect in healthcare, again, everybody is so busy all the time. You can't expect them to reach out to you when they have a problem. You kind of have to pull the problems out of them um, and be very proactive about those things. So it's about having those regular meetings. I mean, you don't want to bludgeon people with meetings, obviously, but you really can't count on them to pick up the phone and call you. No matter how available you make yourself, it's just unrealistic expectation. You know, it's about kind of seeing what's important to them, having regular meetings, making sure you're making those expectations uh, and, and meeting them, you know, to the degree that they want. And then also, you know, you've got to follow through when they have a problem, you've got to demonstrate that you're making efforts to solve it. You know, a lot of times just showing that you're making an effort to solve it kind of will give a little bit more patience to, to the referral source, you know, and, but ultimately you do have to solve it because that at some point that patience will run out. So for us, you know, these relationships do mature over time and you can kind of get into a cadence where maybe you're meeting less frequently, uh, or maybe there's a little bit more tolerance for not meeting expectations. You know, once you kind of build relationships, they can be quite durable um, with referral sources, but you know, in those early stages, it's got to be relatively high touch. And I think that also it's, you know, one thing I learned in management consulting is you, you've got to always have this touchstone at the beginning of the meetings where you kind of say, this is where we are in the relationship. This is where we're going. So we're kind of in this phase where we're meeting more now, but it will get to a point where we don't have to meet quite so much. And that's an important thing to just remind people kind of level set at the beginning of those meetings. Can you talk about maybe one of the challenges either you had as a leader over the past five years or that the business had that you guys got through and kind of how you push through that? Oh, well, we've been through a, a, a lot of different challenges. I think, um, you know, managing change in healthcare is very, very difficult. Again, people are status quo biased. And, uh, and I think once you start getting into some of these changes, there's a lot of excitement and changes can almost be kind of prismatic where everybody looks at it and they see the outcome that they want to see for themselves, <laughs> even if that's not realistic. And so, you know, always kind of setting expectations and kind of keeping the motivation going, uh, particularly with healthcare providers where they're, you know, the world zooms in very narrow every day in the patient encounter. So you kind of have to have these meetings where you can zoom it out and, and show them again where you are in the trajectory of things. But I think the biggest challenge for us has really been uh, managing, you know, financial expectations and, and cost containment, you know, even though we're doing these strategic things, we're still running a business day to day. And so, you know, dealing with uh, managing contracts with our vendors, uh, even like the benefits that we procure and things like that, it just takes a lot of financial discipline. That's one of the things that I really feel like I bring to the group is being able to kind of be very tight about those things because, you um, you know, a lot of people think that healthcare providers make a ton of money. And so they're always marketing to you to sell services. They're always trying to get the rates up or whatever. And you just have to be very uh, strict about your financial discipline. Where should people start if they know there is a problem, but they don't know what to do about it? Because maybe it's been like this for the past five or 10 years 
and it's working kind of, you know, where should they start? Yeah, I think it's always good. This is another thing I picked up in management consulting to be very, you know, just consultative and go around and do interviews with people and get different impressions of, you know, what they think the problems are. Um, And then you can bring all that together and kind of assimilate it. And even if you don't end up solving a problem that somebody brings up, they feel very bought in on the process. And you can kind of reason with them about why you're going to focus on some other problem. Um, so that, that, that's kind of part of the whole process of change management. You have to adhere to no matter what. The other thing is that I think you really have to understand the way that people make decisions. You know, healthcare providers, particularly physicians, nurse practitioners, they're very logical, but they tend to decide emotionally. And I don't mean they decide irrationally, but you just have to understand that you have to have these logical conversations with them. But ultimately, the decisions are, are really made on kind of an emotional basis. So once you kind of understand that a little bit, um, you know, that kind of lends itself to the process of change management as well. Let's shift gears a little bit to the industry. And what are some key industry dynamics that you are seeing which might not be obvious or people know it, but they don't know really that they need to take action now on. Yeah. um, Well, I think one of the things that when you look at the past 10 years, there's been a lot of private equity investment um, in healthcare. And there's a couple of things going on with that. The first thing is that a lot of healthcare demand is completely inelastic. And this is why you see things like investment in anesthesiology, emergency room, because you're really not in a position to choose your provider. When you uh, need those services, you really need them. And there's no substitutes available. You can't shop around for them. So that really drives itself to um, a positive investor uh, opportunity, right? Because there's really not very much competition or market pressure. Um, And so those folks can invest in groups. They can be very aggressive with negotiating with insurers. They can be aggressive on collecting. Um, You know, again, by the time you present to an emergency room, you don't really, you're not thinking about why I need to shop around for the service. Um, So that's one aspect. Uh, The other aspect is just the fact that there's been a lot of consolidation in general. And so that's something that um, you really can't manipulate, but you have to understand it's a little bit of an immovable object Um, that really drives a lot of where the strategic opportunities are and where they aren't. Um, And so, you know, you really have to understand the market that you're in, what the consolidation landscape looks like. Um, Often, you know, hospitals on the provider side are kind of the grill in the room. So what are they into? Uh, Where are they leaving vacancies that you can try to fill from a strategic standpoint? Um, And then the last part is really on kind of the regulation side. You know, they're really, uh, over the past 20 years, healthcare regulation has um, kind of fallen to the wayside. And so that's got its ups and downs. Um, But you just have to understand that some of the, uh, that, that kind of drives some of these investment decisions as well. And I think you see things like the surprise billing ban that have effects now on some of these places where there's been a lot of private equity investment and the anesthesia and ER and things like that. Um, so some of that regulatory stuff is coming back. It's a, it's a little cyclical, but I think those things are going to kind of tighten up over the next 10 or 15 years. And so, you know, that's kind of thinking about that long-term opportunity um, and understanding where the value creation is going to be and where it's going to start to tighten up. Can you talk a little bit more or dive deeper into what sub industries within healthcare services do you think are going to experience more regulation and more tightening up in the next five years, 10 years? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think emergency room is very saturated from an investment standpoint. Um, I think anesthesia is getting there as well. You know, those are places where I think that the investment opportunities are in decline. Uh, Some of the places where they seem to be um, still improving, where there's still opportunity are in uh, things like dermatology, um, also things that are essentially preventative services, which like gastro, you know, gastro is a huge opportunity because uh, if you think about some of the changes that came with the Affordable Care Act, there was a lot of preventative services that are now required by insurance companies. And one of them is colonoscopies um, and the guidelines of how frequently those should be 
done. And so now if you're doing a preventive colonoscopy, it's zero out of pocket for the patient. And that is, uh, that's a great investment opportunity for people. I think ambulatory surgery is going to be a big deal as well. Even if, you know, there's a lot of migration of services out of the hospital setting, which most expensive into the outpatient setting, you know, as much as possible. That's a trend that's going to continue probably for the rest of our lifetimes. Um, And so there is going to be more volume headed that way. Uh, But also, you know, at some point, the hospitals will have to increase their investment in doing those outpatient procedures too. So you think about it, you can invest in outpatient procedures and you can sort of capture that volume wave. And then at some point, probably you'll sell to a hospital because they're going to need to kind of recapture that volume, even if it's on outpatient basis, which is less profitable for them. So to kind of summarize, ER saturated, anesthesia saturated or getting there and where there is the most opportunity is around dermatology, other kind of preventative services, gastro, ambulatory surgery and outpatient services. Yeah. And, you know, primary care is very hot right now too. Um, That's another dynamic that's going on is that um, a lot of insurers are getting into the provision of healthcare services and the first place that they, you know, they're a little hesitant to do specialty services like gastro or something like that, but they are really interested in doing primary care because primary care is seen as being able to control a lot of downstream utilization. It's, it's kind of similar to what our group does with being on the subacute side of things and being able to control utilization for those patients. In primary care, you're able to kind of control, you know, what specialists are you sending people to, doing more preventative services, these things that are going to, in the long run, um, reduce healthcare spend. So, you know, primary care is a big opportunity as well. I think it remains to be seen if it's a big profit opportunity from the services side, but it's a big profit opportunity to the insurers. So that's another kind of aspect of value creation, which is, you know, understanding who's going to make money off of it and how. But private equity is going to be interested in investing for a profit multiple, but insurance companies are interested because they're going to get this kind of secondary benefit to their core business and they're going to have to pay less medical claims. Um, So that, that gives a lot of, uh, kind of investment leverage to them because they can buy a primary care group for like 10 million and they might save a hundred million in healthcare costs off of that. That's awesome. Uh, no, really interesting. And we can do a whole nother episode on each of the sub industries, but um, let's uh, shift over to a completely different topic and talking about veteran transition. So, uh, you know, you were active and did two deployments in Iraq, uh, in the army. So can you talk about, you know, when you were getting out, when the early 2000, was it 04, I mean, 05, 06, 06, era, yeah. 06 you know, after you got out uh, of a couple of years in the army, you know, what was your transition like and what did you do? Well, what would you do differently? And then can you talk about, uh, job paths within healthcare services that you think might fit somebody who has been through a, 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 an elite pipeline and is, as opposed to, uh, you know, going to work at a warehouse or whatever that is, you know, I mean, our, and I'm, I'm saying that just because uh, our members in 51 vets uh, come from primarily the aviation community and the special operations pipeline. And so we're focusing on a lot in the finance sector, but we haven't talked about healthcare, for example in the career paths within that. So can you talk a little bit about your transition up? Yeah, well, when I got out of the Army in 2006, I went straight to grad school to do a joint um, uh, master's in business and public health. Um, so that was, I would definitely recommend doing that if somebody's interested in pursuing graduate school. Doing a residential program is a great way to just sort of have this in-between time without having to go straight to work. And Um, I think the biggest benefit for me of doing that program was really kind of learning from people in business. You know, it was like putting myself on a glide path to learn how to talk, how to network, um, you know, how to build a resume and and what's important. And just to hear from other people what they're interested in doing, why are they interested in doing it? That kind of really helped inform my career path into consulting. Um, So that's one thing. I think for people that are interested in going directly into industry, um, you know, there, like I said, there's so much opportunity and investment in healthcare services right now. I think it's a great place for vets to be because anytime you're doing these acquisitions, there's going to be some type of post-merger integration um, or, you know, 
change management, trying to improve the profitability. I think veterans really excel at that um, because it's uncertain and it's kind of like the dog that catches the car, you know, private equity group might buy a group and they're like, okay, what now? I think uh, vets are really good at figuring that stuff out. Um, and they're unintimidated by the ambiguity of having to, um, you know, create new strategies to save money, to integrate people, whatever. I think that um, the kind of indomitability of vets of always getting back up after you're knocked down um, and the things that we've been through in, in combat, you know, really gives us a determination to kind of solve those problems. And I've seen over and over again, you know, people that are not vets, they kind of have a lot of the zeal to get into it. And then they get there, they don't know what to do. Um, so I think that's kind of really excel at that type of change management and transformation. There we go. Well, we have covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time. And I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. I hope, uh, I hope it's valuable for folks that um, are interested in getting into healthcare. There we go. And if people would like to connect with you, what's the best way to reach out? Yeah, LinkedIn, um, pretty active on LinkedIn uh, and always willing to kind of, you know, do a Zoom or give some advice to folks that are transitioning. Um, you know, I just want to see vets succeed. And I think, uh, can't tell you how often I'm in a room of high performing people and I'm the only vet. So I'd love for that to be different. There we go. All right. Thanks so much. <laughs>